Oh, great. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Great, thank you very much, uh, Julia, for, for the introduction. Uh, it's my, my pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you also for the invitation. And thank you all for, for coming to, to my talk today. I see uh, a lot of names, uh, familiar names, which is, which is nice to see. Um, I'm going to talk today about um, a topic that was coming up in the in the in the book of my uh, PhD already that I was, I was doing in the lab for the years at the University of Burn um, at the Airwalk and uh, kept uh, to be a topic throughout my, my postdocs that I, I used to work mainly with uh, C-spine uh, stickleback. <clears throat> and you might have heard about the topic already a year ago a bit by my colleague Joanna Meyer, uh, who presented on cichlids and butterfly, uh, butterflies during uh, her talk in the MeGen uh, seminar series. So maybe more general to start my uh, research interests, they are, they're grounded in basically the question how biodiversity uh, arises and how, how it persists. And uh, as you can see from this highly biased um, sample of pictures that features a lot of colorful birds, um, what got me into this um, into these questions was basically my um, my ornithological uh, obsession to and but what kept me here is really my fascination for uh, evolution and uh, what we can do with genomics um, to learn about biodiversity. And my approach is mostly to look into um, past changes and learning from past changes by constructing them um, with uh, genomic tools. And so one important level of biodiversity, of course, is uh, genetic diversity. And genetic diversity is mainly maintained or determined by, by five uh, factors. The first of them, of course, is mutation that generates new genetic diversity. Um, then the second factor is recombination that uh, mixes the, pre uh, the existing diversity and generates new combinations um, of genes, of alleles, um, by sexual reproduction and by crossovers that happen before sexual reproduction. Um, the third one is migration, which can increase genetic diversity um, on a population level, so on the alpha diversity level, um, but it can also reduce genetic diversity in terms of uh, distinctive net populations, so better diversity level. And part of migration is, of course, also admixture, so um, introgressive hybridization, so when different uh, divergent lineages have gene flow with each other uh, and introgress into each other. And something I will be talking a bit more about. Um, in during the talk. The fourth uh, major factor that determines genetic diversity is uh, selection, which can reduce genetic diversity. Um, for example, by purifying selection, removing harmful uh, genetic variants, but also positive selection. So the, the, the favoring of a new variant by selection reduces diversity in the long hand. And that's just shown here by one example, um, where actually uh, if a new mutation turns up and becomes very frequent in a population, um, it also it, it gets fixed. Ultimately, diversity is lost in that region, and also diversity that was linked to this original one mutation that occurred in a population. So, um, all all this this the lack of diversity around this first haplotype that goes to high frequency leads to a dip in genetic diversity around a site that is under selection in the genome. So, also. Um, selection, positive selection, leads to um, re reduction of genetic diversity in that sense. However, there's also selection, for example, balancing selection that maintains um, genetic diversity. So that is, uh, is particularly um, selection for, um, uh, for two different uh, variants of an allele to be maintained. And the fifth major factor is a population size or, or demography, so change of population size. Um, population size determines how efficient selection can be in, uh, for example, removing uh, diversity, but also how, uh, how prevalent drift is in a population that might lead to random fixation of uh, alleles and loss of genetic diversity in small populations. And population size also controls the input of mutations in a population. So as, as many individuals we have in the populations, as many individuals can receive uh, new mutations. And here's just uh, two, impressive, uh, two examples for that. So um, in a case where um, 
selection is very efficient in large populations. So this is a study that has been uh, published years ago in, in, in science on passenger pigeon, a species that used to be the most common bird species in the world with a population of several billion that uh, were clouding the skies in North America. And uh, a study of their genomes of this now extinct species that was hunted to extinction shows that actually it had a quite low genetic diversity in the center of chromosomes um, where there's a high, uh, <clears throat> a high effect of, uh, link, uh, of linkage. So when, uh, when basically slightly deleterious mutations get removed, all the linked variation uh, is also removed from those populations and which leads to these kind of dips in diversity um, compared to a second species here in blue, where which has quite similar diversity levels across the chromosome, but has, has much smaller population sizes, so where selection is not so efficient. And the last point that uh, mutation supply can be uh, important in evolution is illustrated especially with um, animals that are large-bodied animals, where um, mutation might be uh, limited for, for adaptation. So here it is, uh, in large-bodied animals, um, res researchers have shown that there's a correlation between the total diversity that it's found in populations in synonymous sites, so uh, diversity that is not under selection, and between signatures of positive selection, so where there's uh, basically a substitution for amino acid uh, changes, so um, changes that are um, due to selection. So, which means that the more diversity there is, um, the, the more adaptation is possible in those, those populations. So, especially in those large-bodied, um, small population size um, species, mutations might therefore be limiting to allow adaptation to um, changing environments, for example. So besides genetic diversity, the second uh, important level of biodiversity I'm going to talk about today is, is of course, species uh, diversity. And the main question here is how it arises. It's one of the main questions I'm, I'm doing research uh, with. And the process, of course, is speciation by which species, species diversity arises. And <clears throat> the question is very simple. So uh, speciation is uh, a process which uh, or from one population, from one species, two new species are arising. And more formally defined, uh, speciation is defined as the evolution of uh, reproductively isolated populations that can ultimately live in the same uh, place. So basically, two populations that can coexist. And this definition, of course, goes back to the biological species concept as it was defined by Ernst Meyer, that put this uh, strong emphasis on the evolution of uh, reproductive isolation between populations. And how Ernst Meyer imagined such a uh, speciation to occur is uh, mostly in, in the scenario of allopatry. So for example, that the population gets separated into two subpopulations that then evolve independently from each other. And during that evolution, some uh, mutations might occur. They might go to fixation, maybe due to selection, maybe due to drift. And those mutations, in the end, will become incompatible uh, with each other between those populations after they meet again. And that might also lead to the evolution of assortative mating then between those species uh, that have become different species. Um, in the original notion, however, uh, how Darwin imagined that speciation would happen, um, he didn't place such an emphasis on this uh, on isolation, but he thought more about selection, uh, sexual selection, natural selection, um, driving the process of speciation. And that's something that doesn't require um, geographic isolation, but could also occur in a context of sympatry or parapatry, so where <coughs> new species arise either at the same place or across a, a geographic um, distance where there's always uh, gene flow going on between populations, where uh, sexual selection and adaptation might ultimately lead to those populations that are become isolated from each other. Uh, in reality, however, what, or at least that's um, what, what I think is uh, we most often observe in nature is that uh, there's something in between a complex scenario where all these factors probably play, play a role. So where uh, natural selection, sexual selection, but also the evolution of incompatibilities uh, might be quite important and phases of geographic isolation that might lead to the evolution of species in most cases. 
So how uh, do we connect this process of speciation with um, genetic diversity and how um, genetic diversity evolves within um, those evolving species? Uh, in traditional models of speciation, such as allopatric um, speciation um, that I introduced before, the idea is usually that genetically, when those populations are isolated, new mutations might arise uh, in those different populations that will become then those incompatibilities. And uh, of course, because mutation, especially in these large-bodied animals, is a slower process, um, speciation might thus be a quite slow process as well. So until enough incompatibilities are fixed in those different um, populations, that they become uh, fully isolated and can invade each other's ranges again. Um, when speciation happens with gene flows, such as in parapatric speciation or in sympatric speciation, this process is thought to take even much longer speciation because when incompatibilities arise and they, there, is, there might be some selection against, um, against incompatibilities persisting in a population if they're not fully fixed. And so uh, this process of becoming uh, different species with gene flow theoretically might actually take much longer. One problem with uh, these theoretical concepts, traditional ones, is that they cannot explain cases, especially here in these larger bodied animals, um, that are mutation limited, where speciation takes place in a very, very short time scale. And uh, here I'm especially showing some adaptive radiations. So these are single lineages that uh, rapidly evolve the high diversity of species um, that are also ecologically very diverse. And the, the textbook examples I'm showing you here are, of course, uh, Galapagos finches with their huge variation in, in beak size that are adaptations to different food resources uh, on the Galapagos archipelago that evolved over, I think, uh, four to five million years. And here in uh, Eastern Africa, or in, in generally in Africa, there are several radiations of cichlid fishes that have uh, evolved equivalent, also very different, um, so, so to speak, uh, fish beaks, so uh, very different uh, body size and mouth shapes that allow them to explore different niches within newly formed lakes, such as Lake Victoria, Tanganyika, Malulabi, uh, in very, very recent time scales sometimes, and also in parallel between those lakes. So um, for Victoria, by the way, that's um, currently we think that's 15,000 years ago. So this uh, extremely, extremely short time scale um, to imagine that mutations could, could contribute much to this um, uh, huge diversity that we see, species diversity. So how can those be explained genetically? Some alternative models have been uh, proposed already uh, a long time ago, and they're mostly based on two different uh, substrates of genetic variation. So one of them is uh, admixture derived uh, variation, where basically divergent lineages uh, or different species, they hybridize and they create um, a hybrid population or a hybrid species or a hybrid swarm that then either becomes uh, an adaptive radiation, such as uh, in the case of, of cichlids, or um, just um, basically evolve to become their own one or several species uh, of hybrid lineages. And uh, there's different models that have been described for this, for, for example, hybrid speciation, uh, allopolyploid, homopolyploid, um, adaptive radiations from hybrid swarms, and so on. A second group of models uh, involves standing genetic variation, so variation that is already present in a single population or a single species. And these include, for example, founder flush, the founder flush model, um, or the transporter hypothesis, where um, pre-existing variation in a population is reassembled into several new species, or one or, new, one or two new species. However, what all these uh, models have in common is that the central mechanism is really that uh, pre-existing variation that has been existing for probably a very long time is within a short time reassembled into new combinations. And that is basically then the, the main speciation process. So pre-existing old variation that gets reassembled in new combination. And in a, in a review that uh, so Jana Meyer and Ole Seyas and I wrote a few years ago, we, we um, proposed this term combinatorial mechanisms um, uh, as an underlying umbrella term for um, these mechanisms that, that old genetic variation reassembly leads to new species. 
And indeed, in our review uh, on adaptive radiations and the rapid speciation genomic studies, and, and also in the, in the last few years since actually those, this review was published, um, there was a lot of evidence uh, coming out for, from studies of adaptive radiations and of cases of rapid speciation that show that uh, often in those cases, um, if there was a mixture event or standing genetic variation has been reassembled several times um, to kind of lead to this rapid speciation. So why should such old genetic variation be important at all in speciation? So the first argument for that is that um, all the alleles, all genetic variation has already been pretested by selection, um, has been seen by selection. And uh, the other part of it is basically that it occurs in an appreciable allele frequency already in a population. Or when hybridization happens, it would be uh, in a frequency that's starting maybe at 50-50 for a hybrid population, which is much uh, larger than a new mutation that happens, which is mostly deleterious and very rare. So it, it might take some time until a new mutation might be seen by selection at all. In our review, we also observed that um, cases where new species are, arose from standard genetic variation, they're often um, led to so-called parallel ecological speciation. So cases where similar ecotypes or early species emer emerged several times <coughs> in parallel in response to selection to, to divergent habitats. One example here is the example of this um, long or short winged beetle that live in intertidal habitats across the coast of Europe, and uh, where the short winged beetle basically has uh, evolved multiple times um, towards uh, during the colonization of the long winged beetle towards the north from standing genetic variation. So, from locally colonizing populations of long winged beetles and became short winged beetles again through, through selection. And here, uh, the meta population size, of course, matters for the standing genetic variation to be maintained uh, within, a, within the species. Um, much more often, uh, it was that mixture variation in those cases uh, that had the higher potential to lead to um, the evolution of adaptive radiations or to the evolution of hybrid species that really then became different from their parental species. And one nice experiment that was done in the last years was by uh, Aaron Comerald and Daniel Matute, which crossed many different lines of uh, Drosophila experimentally and tested them for the evolution of a hybrid species that might be reproductively isolated from their parents. And they indeed found a certain uh, zone of divergence between the parental species where it became uh, more probable that hybrid species might actually, or several hybrid species, might actually evolve from certain crosses. Um, at mixture variation, it doesn't only have, uh, doesn't only lead to a very high uh, genetic variation in the beginning. So when you have uh, divergent uh, parental species that mix, there's there's also a high, uh, high load of genetic diversity. Um, there's there might also be uh, a high load of incompatibilities that might be segregating that might uh, help establish the new evolving species. And there's also um, often a lot of phenotypic variations. In, transgressive phenotypes where the variation of the offspring exceeds the variation of the parental species that might allow them to colonize new niches. And that's, that's why we think these are uh, mechanisms that predispose adaptive radiations to happen and uh, so that the single lineage then can colonize multiple um, uh, niches, multiple new niches. So um, today I want to show you some examples from my own uh, research and uh, mostly with three spine stickleback actually. So some things that I've um, finished by now. Um, uh, we'll continue on other things uh, later. I will maybe tell you about later. With, um, and that mainly is about one case of um, speciation, so rapid ecological speciation of three spine stickleback um, that I uh, studied during my PhD and then later postdoc. And then uh, two cases of rapid adaptation where uh, all genetic variation was important in uh, radiation of three spine stickleback in Canada. So let's first talk about Lake Constance stickleback. So uh, given that many of you, I guess, are in Germany or uh, at least close, not all of you. Um, lake Constance is a big uh, lake at the border of uh, Germany, Switzerland and Austria. Uh, it's roughly 450, um, 540 square kilometers and several hundred meters deep. Um, and 
uh, the special thing about Langer Constance is that it was uh, not colonized by a three spine stickleback until rather recently, according to the ichthyological literature. So, only roughly 150 years ago, people noticed for the first time that uh, three spine stickleback were, were present. This was noted as something, something weird uh, that wasn't known from the lake. And also, some introductions were actually documented from uh, some, some fish breeders that introduced uh, stickleback into, into the catchment. And the one special thing that we that today we find this lake and stream ecotypes. So in the stickleback in the lake look quite divergent from the ones that are found in the stream. That's not only in breeding coloration, uh, but also in the body size. There's a life history differences. For example, lake stickleback, they only start breeding when they're two years old. When the, the stream stickleback, they already start breeding the first year and they also live um, not as long as the lake stickleback. There's difference in the body armor, like spine length, uh, the, the, the size of the plates that they have on their uh, of, of armor plates. That's something I will show you a bit later um, with the second example. And also differences in uh, their feeding uh, regime and basically their niche they're using. However, what's special uh, with Lake Constance stickleback is that the, the lake stickleback, they breed at the shore and also in those um, little creeks and uh, the beginning of all those rivers that flow into Lake Constance. And there they breed actually in sympathy with those stream stickleback and without completely merging back into one phenotype. So where you still see those discrete phenotypes. So during my, my PhD, I looked at the genomic differences between those ecotypes and I found that uh, with rat sequencing uh, data at the time, that there's quite a lot of uh, genomic regions that show strong differentiation between ecotypes in, in two different um, comparisons of lake and stream uh, ecotypes here in Lake Constance. And uh, those regions were distributed across genomes or several regions and multi-locus uh, genomic architecture of these ecotypes. Um, and it's, there's also some bias for low recombination regions such as here on chromosome seven or here chromosome one that involves an inversion that probably facilitates the protection of this um, ecotype architecture against ongoing gene flow in the system. Um, given the young age of 150 years, uh, presumably, um, we always thought that the novel mutations are quite uh, unlikely to cause all these differences. Um, so probably standard genetic variation from a single lineage or a mixture variation might have contributed um, to um, this rapid speciation event here or ecologic speciation event. Um, we wanted to assess this hypothesis then um, by embedding the Lake Constance cycle back into their biogeographic context. And we first used mitochondrial haplotypes from, from our fish and from other data sets that have been published to, um, to see where those stickleback and the constants came from. And to our surprise, actually, uh, it, it turns out that most of the Lake Constance stickleback, um, which are in the, in the Rhine drainage, have uh, haplotypes that are found in Eastern Europe. And so here in the south of the Baltic Sea, uh, in Poland, for example, and this lineage has also colonized much of the Upper Danube, so it's also found in this area. And so Lake, Lake Constance stickleback were predominantly composed of this lineage, but they also had um, ha mitochondrial haplotypes from stickleback that are found in the Rhine and in the Upper Rhone. So these are both uh, kind of li uh, lineages that go back to uh, colonization from the Rhine. So this suggested a mixture um, between different populations that have um, been split for several thousand years and actually even being described as different species by, by some, but which is probably not valid, but based on phenotype differences, which are very strong between those lineages. I used then uh, the site frequency spectrum and, and some demographic modeling to formally test these different scenarios, um, whether the two ecotypes evolved from a single introduction or from two different lineages, and, and whether some mixture was involved between them. And the best supported model was one of uh, hybrid origin, where the stream stickleback was actually uh, an admixture between this Western and Eastern European stickleback. And interesting was also that the admixture proportion wasn't uh, constant. So the, these different stream populations around Lake Constance had different proportions of West and East European alleles, so ranging from almost half, so like 50-50% mixture almost, to a very low percentage in the populations that we have studied in the East, and that were the, the main focus of the earlier study. 
So now the question is, of course, what did this admixture contribute to this ecotype divergence? Uh, to answer these questions, I compared each of those ecotypes to those populations of origin. So first, um, the lake population and the stream uh, population with the Eastern European uh, lineage. And what I show you here is basically a distribution of genetic differentiation across the genome. And uh, for the lake stickleback and stream stickleback, and you can only see one uh, peak basically because those distributions are uh, overlapping and they're almost identical. So there's very little differentiation here um, between both ecotypes and the constants and stickleback from Eastern Europe. When we compare them, however, against stickleback in Western Europe, so in the Rhine, that is not far from the constants, just a bit downstream actually, there's quite a high um, genome-wide differentiation, so here 0 0.5, um, between both the stream ecotypes and the lake ecotypes of lake constants, uh, when you look across all of the genome. So now the interesting thing uh, comes when we look at those regions that define those ecotypes, so that kind of uh, cause this ecotype differentiation at the genetic level. <coughs> and in those regions, it turns out that the stream stickleback is actually quite similar to um, West European stickleback, while the lake stickleback is quite divergent and more similar to the East European populations. <coughs> So this suggests that um, the recruitment of Western alleles in Lake Constance to this Eastern uh, European genomic background facilitated the evolution of these ecotypes um, in this very short timescales of uh, 150 years. I furthermore asked whether these lake and stream stickleback in Lake Constance are not just mere Western and Eastern lineage stickleback that have introgressed a bit. And to answer that question, I looked especially at, uh, at um, those regions again that define the ecotypes. And I looked whether those alleles are of Western or Eastern European origin for alleles that are uh, fixed in our samples between those lineages. And indeed, it turns out that actually most of the um, regions where those that distinguish those ecotypes, the lake stickleback has Eastern alleles and the stream stickleback has Western alleles. However, there's also quite a high um, proportion of um, fixed alleles where the relationship is the opposite. So where the stream stickleback have eastern alleles and where the lake stickleback have western alleles at high frequency. And so it seems that those uh, lake and stream stickleback in Lake Constance are not just uh, a secondary contact of those two, but are really a reassembly of these uh, old genetic variants. Um, so to kind of make new genetic combinations um, of these reassembled variants. So to conclude this part um, on early ecological speciation, I showed you that there was secondary contact and that mixture between uh, two divergent stickleback lineages um, that has taken place in Lake Constance, and that that mixture facilitated um, adaptation to these divergent lake and stream habitats there. And the persistence of this multi-locus um, genomic architecture suggests that there must be some, uh, some reproductive isolation or very strong selection at least um, be present that maintains those complex uh, phenotypes and genotypes. And therefore, uh, admixture seems to have uh, facilitated this rapid ecological speciation in a, on a very short time scale. Okay, with this, I would like to, uh, to switch gears a bit and look a bit more into um, one specific case of adaptation uh, to one environmental uh, niche in Stickleback. Uh, in my postdoc with Tom Reinken at the University of Victoria, I had uh, the opportunity to, to work with Respine Stickleback from an archipelago that was off the west coast of Canada. It's called Haida Gwaii. And the special thing about that archipelago is that it, it was mostly submerged by, by the glaciers during the last ice age. And uh, when those, uh, those glaciers retreated, um, uh, many, many hundreds of lakes and, and very divergent freshwater habitats became available to fish uh, in the last eight to 10,000 years. And that includes today what we see um, very deep, large lakes uh, that are uh, very uh, clear water, for example, uh, to very dark stained. They look like a, like a very, very strong tea. Um, you find very small ponds 
that are eutrophic and others that are oligotrophic, um, that are in box, that are hidden in forests and so on. So there's a huge diversity of freshwater habitats. And Tom Reinken, during his career and many, many years, he has sampled over 700 lakes across the archipelago and uh, checked them for a presence of stickleback and studied the, the variation that we found there, phenotypic uh, and genetic variation in those sticklebacks. And what he found was uh, is quite, for a stickleback uh, people at least, quite spectacular that we, we know from very few other places, uh, which is a huge um, genetic diversity. There are some stickleback that have uh, almost lost all their armor. So here on the sides, you can see bony uh, plates on the on the sides of the body of stickleback that are present in some that are ancestral, that are in marine habitats. They're always fully plated as a protection from, from predators. Uh, there are some of them that have lost part of them and some of them have lost all the armor. Same for spines. Uh, there's huge variation in body size. I told you before that the lake and stream stickleback in Lake Constance, they are uh, they differ a bit compared to those. That's uh, quite minor. So here there's some stickleback that breed at the adult size of uh, four and a half centimeters and other populations where they, they get up to 12 centimeters and they live up to eight or 10 years. And while other populations, they live for just one year. So there's huge variation in all these uh, phenotypic characters. And Tom um, spent many years studying the relationship of the environment with uh, the phenotypes that have resulted there and that evolved in those habitats. And he identified three major axes of selection that explain this phenotypic variation. So the first one is uh, light spectrum, which you can see here on the bottom, bottom right, um, which describes basically whether the water is, is very clear, as you will see uh, in the marine habitat, or very dark stained. And so that's a, a gradient of transmissibility uh, of light. Then there is the second uh, major axis, predation regime. So there's this three types of habitats, uh, habitats that are dominated by insect predators, where there's no fish and no birds hunting the fish, uh, habitats that are dominated um, by um, rainbow trout and birds. Those are usually uh, large and also clear water lakes. And there's also a, a habitat that's dominated by cutthroat trout and bird predators. These are tend to be more uh, dark stained lakes. And in ecosystem size, there's also huge differences from very small creeks, streams where stickleback live, to really, really large um, lakes that have uh, even a pelagic uh, zone where stickleback eat zooplankton. Um, <clears throat> so Tom teamed up uh, quite a few years before I started my postdoc with David Kingsley and uh, at the time Felicity Jones, Federico de Palma, who were sequencing um, 58 uh, whole genomes and 29 from 29 populations across this, uh, this adaptive radiation in the archipelago. And they chose uh, samples to maximize this phenotypic variation and also this variation in the, the niche space that you see here on the left side. So when I came in and had, uh, was working with this data, my first uh, thing was to inspect the adaptation of this visual system because it's one of the most obvious um, uh, axes of selection in the, in the variation. And so when you look at those light spectra in a marine habitat, ancestral marine habitat, there's actually quite a broad light spectrum uh, with downwelling light and sidewelling light that's visible um, and gets less and less the deeper you go, of course. And this light spectrum is very similar to a clear water lake that's colonized by a stickleback. So with lots of downwelling and sidewelling light. However, in a blackwater habitat, the light spectrum looks quite different. So there's uh, much less light penetrating um, with depth and there's almost no sidewelling light, meaning that you can look up, but uh, look left and right is, um, and the head is very difficult because there's almost no light coming from the sides. And there's also a strong uh, lack of these short wavelengths that are not transmitting very well to, through those tannin stained waters, which uh, makes this whole environment looking red and kind of redshift. So here I'm just going to briefly show you um, um, a video where you can see how this habitat changes when you actually go down in the water. Here's uh, Tom on a boat where he submerges uh, a camera into approximately three meters depth. I'm just trying to see whether I can. Uh, make this uh, video stream a bit better for everyone. But no, let's, let's just try like this. I hope you can see 
how um, how the light changes with time here. I'm just going to replay it again. Um, so what you can see is that the that the the light basically vanishes mostly, and it turns into one nocturnal, almost monochromatic uh, light environment. So something that's um, obviously very constraining for, for a fish that has to see something in its environment. And here is a second uh, short video that shows you stickleback around its breeding site, in roughly 30 centimeters depth. And uh, in this case, uh, it's you can see that it's very hard to see anything sideways, so being it a predator or maybe a mate, um, and also prey. And you might also see, I've seen there's some stickleback people in the crowd, that the stickleback here is, a, is, a, is actually melanistic. So in those habitats, they usually turn black. They don't have their fleshy red throat, but actually a black throat that maximizes the contrast with the blue eye that the stickleback have during the breeding, um, during the mating season. So how could stickleback adapt their color vision? So color vision in stickleback is mostly through the, the cone opsins uh, in, the, in the retina. And stickleback have uh, four different uh, genes, so four different cone opsins that uh, are responsible for color vision. These are the UV sensitive, uh, SWS1, SWS2, the blue sensitive, uh, green sensitive, RH2, and the LWS, the red sensitive opsin. They have different peak sensitivities for uh, catching photos photons and therefore um, uh, basically giving a signal, uh, signal about certain wavelengths further uh, to the brain that will be processed on the way. Um, the interesting thing about those opsins um, or what, what makes them a nice entry point to understand adaptation is that um, we can from the genotype more or less predict what the phenotype will be. And there's good ways to do that because of experimental um, assays uh, with the bovine rhodopsin that have exchanged certain amino acids um, in those in those opsins and showed that when you uh, exchange one for the other amino acid, the, the peak sensitivity can be shifted one or the other way. So up to longer or to shorter wavelengths by certain uh, certain amount of nanometers. And uh, through that work, many of the so-called so key site mutations have been identified in those opsin genes, where we can predict from the genetic change what the phenotypic change will be. So what I did uh, to identify um, selection uh, on those, those regions across the radiation is to look for, for signatures of selection in the genome. And there's two basic, two simple ways, uh, more or less simple ways to do that. So one is an outlier approach. So if you imagine um, you have a population, you have certain genetic markers, and you would uh, observe the change before and after selection for one certain variant in the genomes, for example, this red one here. And so if you uh, compare those two before and after, you would expect that the ones that is selected, this favorite by selection, increases in frequency much faster than all the other variants uh, that are somewhere else in the genome. And so one way to find um, these regions on the selection is to look for these outliers. So the ones that changed in frequency a lot, or uh, for example here, look at population differentiation um, between a population that has experienced certain selection and one that didn't. Um, a second approach with whole genome data um, is to, instead of looking just at some markers in the genome, uh, we could look at one chromosome where selection is happening. And here a similar thing happens. So the, the variant under selection, it will increase in frequency, but because it is linked to many other variants on the same chromosome, those will also increase in frequency and leave kind of characteristic signature that is called selective sweep around this favored uh, variant. And such signatures include that it's a very long haplotype that is very common in the population and has a, a, a genomic region with reduced variation around it. And basically, when we look for selection with these selective sweep signatures, we basically look for um, the rim of a crater, uh, like, like you would look for an impact site for a meteorite. So uh, I try to do that with uh, haplotype-based uh, selective sweep statistics, so that scan for these selective sweeps um, across all these 29 populations of stickleback on Hyde of Y. And when I did that, I, uh, luckily in a high recombination region of the genome, found a region that stood out uh, by really a lot. Um, that was an outlier across all of the rest of the genome. 
And uh, in the middle of this region uh, were these two um, opsins sit, uh, sitting there, so the SWS2, which is the blue sensitive, and the LWS, which is the red sensitive opsin. So in that sense, this would then basically be the crater signature that I was been, have been looking for. And you can see it here, there's low diversity here in this region, uh, low haplotype diversity. And yeah, some, some haplotypes that are very, very long here at show kind of an array of blue. So these were two options now, so the red and the blue sensitive. So which one is actually the interesting one that has been favored by selection in those, in this, uh, across these light environments? It turns out that actually it was the, the blue sensitive. The blue sensitive had uh, not only uh, was not only in the center of the signature, but also it had seven amino acid changes and I think only one synonymous change uh, in the protein sequence, which is um, of course uh, very highly unlikely and suggestive of uh, positive uh, selection for these amino acid changes. And this amino acid changes included two key sites uh, where we actually can predict that the one haplotype, the one that was um, selected for, uh, represents a, a red shift in the absorption spectrum of this opsin towards basically the, the part of the, um, of the light spectrum in Blackwater Lakes where there is still more light, some more photons to catch. So this made sense in terms of uh, the direction of adaptation that we would have expected. And we also found this environmental correlation so that this uh, haplotype under selection, this weep haplotype, which is just shown here and across the genotype space of all these available haplotypes, is the only one that was really found in those Blackwater lakes. And it is this haplotype, so the same haplotype, that is present in all those uh, Blackwater lakes that have been colonized independently from marine stickleback, which suggests that um, there was parallel evolution going on and standing genetic variation was, was crucial to facilitate adaptation uh, to this habitat. Then thanks to a, a fantastic paper by Fabio Cortesi and colleagues um, who reconstructed the evolutionary history of this gene, of this blue sensitive opsin, uh, I was able to put these results into a bigger, bigger context. Text. Um, it turned out that uh, of this blue sensitive opsin, uh, there's most fish actually have um, two paralogous copies. So each individual then has two copies available to them. Um, and those copies show exactly the same uh, amino acid differences between uh, that we found among the red shifted and the blue shifted uh, alleles that are present in Stickleback, among many others, of course, that are still between those paralogous copies. Um, it turned out that the stickleback lineage must have lost somehow one of those copies. And actually it was the blue um, sensitive copy that is still present in many other fish. And the red sensitive copy then was turned to a blue sensitive copy uh, in the uh, three span stickleback lineage somewhere in the evolutionary past between those 200 million years and roughly 10 million years where those different stickleback species split from each other. And only within the lineage of three span stickleback, so probably in the last million or a few million years, um, a second haplotype has evolved with exactly the same uh, amino acids uh, being red shifted or blue shifted at these key positions. And as I've shown you before, so stickleback, they have adapted to these clear water and black water habitats by having these different alleles on a population level. Um, but what, what turned out also from, from uh, other published research is that uh, other fish actually also adapted to those different environments convergently with the same amino acid changes, but not uh, with different haplotypes, but with uh, over or under expressing these copies that are red or blue shifted. So for example, black bream uh, that is raised in, in, I think, mangrove habitats, there's somewhat, somewhat black water, um, they will uh, go into, into the sea um, or in, into uh, to marine habitats, which are clear water and uh, during between those life stages, they over and under express those two um, parallax, so the blue and the red shifted. It's the blue shifted in the, in the clear water lakes and the red shifted on the black water lakes. And similarly, the blue feeling kindyfish, um, which is studied by Rebecca Fuller, lives in different habitats that are either clear water or black water. And those populations also show over or under expression of one or the other parallax. So it seems that uh, the same molecular solution here with the same amino acid substitution that evolved here over longer time scales through mutations um, 
was was kind of used to adapt to this uh, same environmental challenge of clear water and black water habitat um, over very long evolutionary time scales. So to conclude, conclude this part, um, I've shown you here that the same environmental challenge can lead to the same molecular solution here at the amino acid level at least. And in the case of uh, stickleback, um, this change can be can be rapid when it uh, involves standard genetic variation. So again, old genetic variation that was involved here into adaptation to these blackwater environments. And on a longer time scales, uh, some mutation can cause this convergent evolution to the same uh, habitat challenges. So so over millions of years, uh, new mutations might lead to the same molecular solution. And so the source of genetic adaptation, um, whether it's new mutations or standing genetic variation, um, might depend on the time scale. And so rapid adaptation here in this case was facilitated by this old genetic variation that was present. Okay, with that, I would like to, the, to switch to the, the third part, um, which is about not only this one axis of adaptation um, in the high degree radiation, the light spectrum that we just looked at, but the combined uh, combination of all these three major axes of selection, so predation regime, ecosystem size, and light spectrum. And that's some research that's, um, that probably no, none of you have seen yet because it's in, in press uh, right now at Evolution. Um, so, by incorporating those additional niche axes, we were asking what genomic changes occur um, during adaptive radiation when not just a single new niche is colonized or a single new niche axis is important, but actually when there's many different niches in niche space. And uh, one thing that is uh, predicted by, by theory for, for adaptation to, to different environments and also to a multitude of environments, adaptive radiation theory, is that often a uh, simple genetic architecture uh, might be involved, especially if there's ongoing gene flow between populations, so that um, that uh, adaptation um, can can survive or uh, gene flow. And often there's uh, this also leads to genomic clustering, so that the genomic architecture of adaptation is actually simple in terms of the location, so that many of those regions are in a, sim a single location or in a few locations, and that there's not too many uh, regions in genome that are involved. And we wanted to test that with this um, complex uh, niche space of the Haida Gwaii stickleback that evolved into all these different uh, niches and adapted to those. In order to identify signatures of selection in, in this part, I used a, a demographic control because, as you can imagine, given the geographic structure and having only one individual per population, uh, it is quite difficult to identify um, signatures that are unusual and so in this uh, this case i basically reconstructed the demographic changes of each of those populations from with psmc uh, approximated those with psmc and uh, did some uh, simulations some coalescent simulations um, for the statistics of interest that i was uh, looking at and i was simulating basically uh, 1000 whole genome data sets with those uh, 29 populations in uh, and assuming this demographic model and uh, a, de a realistic recombination map for three spine stickleback and after having this uh, neutral distributions for for the statistics of interest which are here ihs and h12 again so um, signatures that allow the detection of these selective sweep signatures um, I identified um, regions in the observed data against this neutral uh, data under the under the expected demographic patterns. It turns out when looking across the genome, there's quite a few regions uh, which are here highlighted with gray bars, and basically the, the black uh, dots are outliers against the neutral distributions for the statistics. And uh, there were 89 putative targets of uh, parallel selection. So this is again, like before, this is signatures of selection that are shared by several populations across this radiation, um, across these 29 populations. And uh, interesting is that those regions are quite distributed across the genome. So there's uh, always small regions where the signatures of selection across all of the genome, and there's quite a high number. So there's not much clustering or not really a known number that we observed here. 
And what also became apparent is that in some of those regions where we find uh, some signatures of uh, co compatible parallel selection, some of them are enriched for uh, old haplotypes, um, so which again supports the role that old genetic variation might be important for such rapid adaptation, such as in this radiation. And here in this case, identified whole haplotypes by looking at the variation in DXY. So DXY is the a measure of absolute divergence between populations. In this case, I just basically compared single genomes with each other. And when you do that, and when you just look at the value of DXY, this value is usually strongly correlated with uh, mutation rates, uh, so variation mutation rate or, um, uh, or diversity, so nucleotide diversity. But when you look at the variation of those values between all comparisons that you're making, uh, you can identify uh, certain regions where between uh, some haplotypes, there's almost no differentiation. Between other haplotypes, there's a very large differentiation, suggestive of, of an old age of those haplotypes. And uh, I found that in those outlier regions, that there's actually an enrichment of those um, regions that have a very high variation in divergence between haplotypes. And some of them, we also know why. Uh, so for example, in this region here, this concerns an inversion that was already known, um, which is typical of one of those older uh, genomic regions that have been around in Stickleback for probably several million years. And this one, for example, was segregating among the freshwater populations. That's one that has, has been described as a typical marine or freshwater um, type, but it's uh, one, one that's actually quite common among uh, the freshwater populations. So in several of those regions, uh, there was an um, as association with the known axis of divergence. So for example, uh, with a predation regime, plate morph, with ecosystem size, gill rake length that's correlated with feeding on, on planktons, or with light spectrum, such as the, the opsins or several other op, uh, genes that are involved in, in vision. However, what was most uh, interesting is that um, when I uh, built a three-dimensional niche space out of this uh, major axis, um, I found that um, most signatures of selection are in the populations that are furthest away from the marine ancestral habitat. And that's something that was only correlated with geography because there was some um, spatial autocorrelation. Um, but it's, it's the strongest effect on the number of selection signatures is really the distance from the ancestral niche and also the number of environmental axes that were involved. So this suggested that um, many targets of selection are involved in uh, parallel adaptive, uh, so in this uh, adaptive radiation of three spines to Quebec, and that old haplotypes were important for the adaptive radiation. And also that uh, niche, niche divergence and dimensionality played a role in predicting the genomic architecture of uh, adaptive radiation. So here also this adaptive radiation depended then on old genetic variation, but also on how complex the niche was where this stickleback adapted to. And so with this, I would like to conclude my talk and um, I hope I was able to show you some cases where old genetic variation, such as standing variation or admixture derived can be important in facilitating rapid adaptation and speciation. And with this, I'd like to thank uh, my postdoc advisors, uh, Ole Seehasen and Tom Reinken, my colleague Joanna Meyer, and you for your uh, attention. And I'm looking forward to answer your questions. <laughs>